So a um, brief intro about myself is, uh, you know, um, uh, who back have mentioned, I lead product at LinkedIn. I also recently published a book called Reimagine, uh, Building Generative a Product with Generative AI. Um, you can search it on Amazon. Um, and uh, yeah, I teach uh, product a lot uh, through LinkedIn Learning, through my PM Learning series on LinkedIn uh, and many other foreign and avenues. Um, I speak frequently um, at top leading universities as well, Fortune 1000 uh, companies. Uh, for example, just yesterday alone, I was speaking in the morning to the C-Suite and Mozilla, the Firefox browser parent company. Uh, at, in the evening, I was speaking at Microsoft uh, to a group of AI startup um, product creators. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about what we want to talk about. Uh, so today I will talk uh, part one and two are about some of the high level general trends around generative AI. Some of you ask, the content is going to be a little bit more high level uh, and basic. So if you have a specific question, feel free to ask them in the uh, Q&A and I'll address them. But the highlight of today's presentation is really more about the four part generative AI product framework. Um, I think some of you are probably aspiring data scientists from what I heard or PM or uh, you know designer. Um, you are part of the product trio, trio that's important to understand, you know, how do we think about designing products with generative AI capabilities. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, a quick disclaimer. Uh, yes, I work for LinkedIn, uh, but um, my the, 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 the framework, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are mine alone, and it does not represent my employer, either LinkedIn or Microsoft. Now with that, let's take a quick look at some of the market trend. So um, ChatGPT hits 1 million user. It's quite a shock uh, in November, 2022, right? I believe many of you probably start your Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving uh, you know, conversation talking about AI. So GPT really puts a face um, of this, uh, this uh, AI phenomenon. Guess how old oh, has AI been a phenomenon actually in the science and academia, you know, space? Just take a guess. Can someone drop a number in the chat? How old oh, is AI? 50 years, decades, 100. Okay, Ben is... Uh... <laughs> It's closer. Yes, it's 84 years as of 2024. So AI has been a fairly, oh, you know, mature, um, um, you know, um, research subjects in academia, right? Uh, but ChatGPT really brings that under the hood, um, you know, to, to the surface. And as of the latest data, GPT maintained a high level of, um, you know, engagement with over 180 million uh, monthly active user and over 100 million um, uh, monthly reoccurring revenue. So that's a pretty substantial number if you think about how long it takes other apps uh, to really get to the scale. Um, I do not count threads, um, uh, you know, that it takes one day to reach 1 million because uh, thread is part of Instagram or Facebook, which they already have an existing distribution. So I would cut out threads and really think about the power of GPT overnight. Um, so, um, and Bloomberg uh, projected that the trend is here to stay, right? It's not just a fad, uh, but it's gonna gonna sustain. So in the next ten years, it's gonna grow from a forty million a billion dollar industry in twenty twenty two to over one point three trillion, growing at a, a, a compounded annual growth rate. Kager of 42%. So that's very, very impressive. Granted, most of the industries are slowing down or growing at, you know, less than 10% or single digit. So this is a very impressive um, uh, growth uh, explosion that's yet to come. So um, not surprisingly, a lot of money is being poured into supporting Gen AI, uh, you know, uh, startups, but most of them are still focused pretty much in the foundation model space, um, as well as tooling to support um, some of those foundational investment. Uh, there's still quite a bit of limitations and constraints that we need to work through before that technology becomes mature enough. Um, and yes, foundational model means like including large language model as well as some of the multi modality uh, models. Um, let's just level set a little bit about Gen AI, what it is, what it can do, what's special about it. Uh, some of you asked earlier, um, so I'll dive in a little deeper. 
So let's compare the characteristic of generative AI from traditional AI and from traditional software products. So one of the key characteristics for GNAI, obviously, is the generative nature of AI, right? So it can create content dynamically based on your prompts, as well as in multi-modality. So not just in text, but in images, audio, code, video. Um, many of you probably seen the ads for OpenAI for Sora, right? The new text to video, uh, you know, prompting app. And it's only going to become more and more mainstream as we, uh, you know, in, in the years to come. Um, so an interesting, uh, you know, uh, uh, creativity uh, demonstration here is that Harvard Business Review used this prompt to combine an elephant with a butterfly um, called... Um, Fantafly, <laughs> and then created a corresponding products illustrate that. So this is sort of one example of creativity, uh, you know, at your fingerprints. How do you leverage that? Um, so unlike, um, you know, similar to other AI products, right? Um, generative AI products are adaptive, ever evolving. You know, there's this notion of uh, prompt brit brit brittleness, meaning sometimes you change a little bit of the prompt the input is going to be very different. And um, ever since I started playing with uh, this tool to write my book since last summer, you know, the technology starts to get better over, over the last six months as well. The context window gets longer now that it has the memory of the entire threats. I remember I used to have to go to a coffee shop and work three to four hours in one chunk before the AI forget about what I was asking it to do in order to write one section of my book because you need that continuously on. Uh, but now AI actually are able to, you know, remember the past conversation in that same, same conversation window, as well as being able to browse the internet outside of that conversation. So it's adaptive, it's ever evolving. It understands you more, better. Some of you might have already tried custom instruction, right? So AI actually understand who you are, what you like to write, what your goals are and aspiration. If you haven't already, highly encourage you to do so. So, but also just like many AI products, it's unpredictable. So you cannot really dictate, I want the output to be this way. Um, so sometimes it creates really great output especially if you prompt it really well, uh, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. So it depends on how well you're able to prompt, how much AI understand the instruction. And then sometimes as the model gets updated, it either gets better or occasionally worse. So there's require a lot of trial and error experimentation. Um, obviously it depends again, like I said, the training data, how good is the data? If you need a fine tune, like a like a large language model for your specific use cases. It depends on how good the data that you provide. Um, and then obviously, unlike traditional software, where the margin is sort of infinite once you create the software, you know, th there's the initial startup costs. And then after that, the margin just goes up. Like you, you can basically provide uh, provision additional seats and people just keep using it. But for GNAI, every call you make to ask for you know, the AI to respond. It's actually a couple of cents, depending on the context window, the token, um, it, it, it gets more expensive. So the economic model of how GNAI product work compared to traditional software product is gonna be a little different. The margin might not be as high as 80 to 90%. So for some of you who use, um, let's say GitHub Copilot to write codes. Um, so GitHub Copilot for developers, software engineers out there, you probably pay, I think around $10, 12, $15 a month. Uh, but Wall Street Journal actually reported that um, peop, uh, the, the power user, the 20% power user who use GitHub Copilot actually costs $80 to serve that group. Since they use so much, they make a lot of costs. Um, so Microsoft are actually losing money in that sentence, right? For every, for the twenty percent of the customer that they service, because the cost it, it, they they get pay uh, for ten fifteen dollars, but um, it actually costs eighty dollars to service that group. So there's some interesting dynamics um, happening there. Now, um, with that in mind, many of you asked about limitations and constraints and challenges, job loss. Uh, you know, how do we work with AI? So I, um, in the book, I included a summary, a, a quick summary of some of the key 
um, dimensions of challenges that I think people are going to face uh, when they are working with AI, both from the basic stuff like the quality of the data, some of the technical limitations, which are getting better over time with smaller language models, uh, you know, higher quality training data, people are spending more time to get proprietary data, uh, but they're still, uh, you know, a legit amount of ethical and social emotional concern that comes with working with AI. <clears throat> Actually, um, excuse me, last um, at Christmas, there was quite a bit of discussion through New York Times about the AI research community. Um, people starting to build up this concept called P Doom. Anyone want to get take a guess what P Doom means for all the data scientists, statistician? Out there, what does P Dune mean? Waiting for people to type in the chat. And if you are able to guess what that means, what do you think the percentage is among the science community? Yes, probability of doom <laughs> of human. Um human, you know, as a species are going to be distinct, distinct because of AI. Uh, yes, apocalypse. So what do you think the percent is among the AI research scientists in Silicon Valley? What percent they're debating um, of P2? Wow, Swathi is very uh, pessimistic. Huh? Anyone else take another guess? 70%. 25%. Okay, so you swing the pendulum. All right. All right. 35%. Okay, so in the science community, people think that it's between uh, 10 to 30% in the next decade um, of, uh, you know, how, how we might or might not be able to control AI. I consider that still in the spectrum of more optimism that AI can, you know, really help humanity than it's taking over. Um, so a, a good percent, um, 10 to 30 um, is probably the normal range. Um, and you want to, to have a healthy dose of skepticism working with this technology, right? Because it, it's it's very powerful. Um, one of the book I recommend folks to read, it's called The Coming Wave, uh, is written by Mostafer, uh, who was the founder of uh, Google DeepMind back in the days. And he wrote a book about this wave that's coming and it's going to, you know, take over humanity uh, if we're it's on contain. So he talks about strategies to create containment um, that can, you know, really make sure the technology is putting to good use. Um, so, so yes, so these are some of the constraints around, you know, working with this technology, which I will illustrate actually in a case study in a moment as we talk about how to build an AI chatbot. Um, so uh, let's get to the meats of today's presentation, which I want to present you with a product framework of how I think about building Gen AI products. So the presentation is about building delightful and responsible Gen AI product. So that entails, you know, delightful means that it's of useful to the user that they enjoy using it, right? Uh, responsible means it's ethical, it's AI for good. So how can we combine the best of both worlds? So I think there's four steps here that, that needs to be involved as uh, product builders thinking about it, whether it's from a data perspective, from an engineering pers perspective, from a product management perspective, or from a design perspective. Um, so the first question is, we need to better understand um, how can AI adds unique value. We don't want to have a technology in search of a problem. It always should start with what's the problem we're trying to solve and how can AI solve it 10x better. Um, the second question is, uh, you know, sort of the tactical aspect of what goes into the prompt, right? The prompt engineering aspect of like, if you were to build a chatbot or any application, how do you put in the instruction? for the AI. The third step is considering a trust framework. There's seven different pillars to consider when it comes to building a responsible, trustworthy AI application. And then last but not least, how do you think about user research? How do you think about user interface differently in the context of, of AI? Now, um, the first step is really about identifying GNAI uh, superpower and in the context of how it can help us solve customer problem in a unique way. 
Um, so GNAI, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, are able to create dynamic multimodal content, but it's also able to, you know, generate data, synthetic data, um, or simulating a scenario or making a prediction. Many of you are, uh, or might heard about Copilot, the concept of Copilot. So it's able to plan and execute tasks like an AI agent, uh, meaning agent that's uh, that's you know helping you executing a, a very narrow task. Um, it's also able to uh, help you really adapt um, to your particular specific uh, circumstances and scenario through real time interaction, mostly in front of a chat or from a, a sort of a, a click, you know, response manner, right? Whether it's a free text phone chat or some form of like, what, tell me more about you and then giving you options to choose. So so it's quite a dynamic hyper-personalization at scale and in real time. Um, and then obviously because of the multimodality nature, it's also making knowledge much more accessible across a, a spectrum, right? Before I was never able to make a mini video or a movie trailer or anything like that, or or paint something um, because, you know, I'm, I, we just don't have illustration skills or movie skills, it takes hours of practice. Illustrators, iMovie and learn all these tools. But now with AI, it's almost, you know, at, the, at a step of like just typing a prompt and depending on how good your prompt, the output will come out. So, with all these superpowers, you need to think about what is the user problem that you're trying to solve that AI can uniquely value at. So many of you are familiar with LinkedIn. Again, not representing my employer's point of view, but it's it's a good use case. So for example, if you're a job seeker going to a job site like LinkedIn that you're trying to you know, find that your next job, um, what do you think are the different use cases um, that you know you need help with, independent of AI? Can someone please drop in the chat? You know, when you're looking for a job, uh, what do you most need help with? When you're going to a job site, or when you're just thinking about job search in general? Better skill matching, searching accurate job. Mm hmm. Mentorship. Resume, contact, I can need help with referral. Yeah, those are really good use cases, right? So let's take um, searching for accurate job and skill matching. They're kind of coming together a little bit. So for example, um, one thing that I heard was that, yeah, a lot of people, if they want to become a data scientist, um, that's an easy way to search for data scientists. But sometimes data scientists could manifest it in business analyst or product analyst or um, uh, uh, you know business intelligence analyst. So there are so many different titles, but the skill set, the underlying skill set could be very similar. And especially in today's macro challenging macro environment, uh, you know, one job title, um, one skill set could manifest it in different job title. And sometimes you might be flexing a little bit to cast a little wider net in order to get your dream job, right? So how can you leverage Gen AI to you know, help you find better jobs? So at the um, matching layer, for example, um, uh, you know, LinkedIn could use AI to get better understanding of what are the jobs and what, what skills are required for a particular job. And then at the seeker level, so the supply level from you guys, you, you can either LinkedIn could tell what skills you have from your resume or profile, um, or, um, you know, there's maybe a chat that we can ask you, like a, like a career coach that asks you, hey, um, you know, Vebov or, you know, who needs mentorship or Swath, um, you know, some other, other folks, Sid, um, what, what jobs uh, are you looking for, Mahesh? Like, um, what kind of skills do you have that you're willing to develop or you already have that you look for um, in your next job? And so this is a high real time interaction, right? Asking you what skills you need and then personalized showing you the right job based on the skill that you have based on under our understanding of the jobs. Um, and then you can maybe even set up alerts, a little agent in the future for like, okay, I'm interested in this kind of job that required this level of skill set and this level of proficiency, you know, help me find those jobs or alert me those jobs whenever it comes up. Um, and then once you have the job, hey, how do you tailor your resume to Ben's point, um, you know, based on the job, right? Um, so that's a little bit of a, a resume content creation. Um, and, and then 
maybe even doing a mock interview, right? Uh, to to make sure you are best positioned for that role. So there's a lot of different skills, uh, you you know, that, that use cases that can be empowered um, through the generative AI um, superpower. But not all use cases are best suited for using AI. Um, AI is not a you know a silver bullet that solves every single problem, right? So AI is best used. Uh, for when a use case is that needs to generate some form of content that looks uh, very fluent and reads very natural. But then it's not as critical that the information is super accurate because right now the limitation of AI could be, it could hallucinate. So sometimes if your profile doesn't have all the skills that you need or you haven't uploaded your resume, um, AI might not be able to match you with the right job. So you don't want the AI to sound so definitive that it recommends the job and thinking that you are the perfect candidate for it because AI might either underestimate or overestimate your talent. So what you need is that AI give you an initial proposal or recommendation uh, where it came up with the re uh, uh, recommendation. So attributing the source of those data and then you can, you as a human, you have the agency to make the final call. You can say, okay, AI did a pretty good job matching me with, you know, the right job opportunity. Or and this is bullshit. <laughs> AI didn't do a good job. But then you have a way to offer the feedback back to AI. Whether you're telling AI, hey, why did you give me this recommendation? Uh, maybe I'll tell you, oh, you didn't do a good job with your resume or maybe certain part of your resume or how you frame your resume is giving it to this recommendation. So then the action could be on you to update. Or it could be AI is not doing a good job, you know, learning about you. And then the AI needs to do some more work to continuously evolve and giving that feedback loop. So there's that two-way conversation for keeping human in the loop. That's the best way right now to use AI. You still have the agency, decision power. Um, but there's a continuous feedback loop to make sure both are doing better. So, you know, job search could be a very frequent use case if you're an active job seeker. So that could be a good use case. There's tangible connection to potential outcome, not in money per se, but more in like, do you apply for jobs? Do you feel more confident applying for jobs? Do you feel better about matching you to the right job? And the friction to start could be pretty low, right? If you already have a, a resume or a profile to be tapped into. Um, obviously, we talk about the quality of the AI output. If it's not great, there needs to be feedback loop for you to you know, give for each other feedback, whether it's action on you or action on the AI. Do we have the data? Again, garbage in, garbage out. So we have a lot of data, for example, in the context of LinkedIn, a lot of job descriptions on the platform, right? We can classify those jobs better based on their skills, um, but then whether we have uh, data available about you, uh, and that's up to you to upload your resume, make sure your profile is up to date, make sure the skill section on your profile up to date, and then obviously, are we differentiating? Like is Indeed or some other job site also offering similar capabilities? Now, um, remember step two and four, um, you know, that we talk about prompt design, trust framework, AI uh, user research. I like to illustrate by taking you through a little case study. Let's say you're all PMs right now, wear your PM hat, product manager hat. You're designing a AI chatbot like Pi uh, from Inflection AI. So let's say you are designing Pi to be a very kind and supportive AI companion that's offering you to chat. You know, this is a friend that helps you to bounce off ideas. Um, you, you know, when you're bored, uh, you, you, you talk to, to this AI chatbot. Now, most people will just stop there as the jobs to be done. JTBD framework to say, okay, this chatbot exists to help me learn something, to be a sounding board, to help me kill time. Now, I want you to think a little deeper if you are a gray product manager with a gray product sense, meaning uh, you know deep understanding of human psychology. You need to be able to compare how is an AI chatbot different from a human friend or a human companion? In what way is AI deep down different from a human in more differentiated way? So some of the, I know I review the answer here. If I were to redo, I'll add a little animation and not review the answer. 
<laughs> but I think the biggest difference between human and AI is how many times, first of all, you always have a human partner at your fingertip that you can bug. Not always, right? Your partner, your husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, or your best friend might not always be available. Well, AI is always available. How many times do you need to think about how to structure your conversation? Let's say you're really frustrated with your boss and you want to complain about it. Well, if it's a close friend, maybe you can just complain. But if it's like an acquaintances or a mentor, you want to ask for advice, you probably need to think about how you want to communicate that, right? So that it doesn't come across like, did you just complain about your boss? What if it's your problem? You know, that, that sense, the self-consciousness of like, oh my gosh, you know, how to talk about a specific sensitive issue, right? Let's say you have a brilliant day um, and then you want to talk to your best friend about it, but your best friend just have a really shit day. So that you're not at the same <laughs> mind space, right? People might get jealous. People might feel insecure. You might feel insecure or jealous either way. So there's a lot of emotions involved in human interaction right? Um, there are certain things you want to talk to your parents about. There are certain things you don't want to talk to your parents about. But but AI does not have this problem. You can just relax and chat about it. So that's a fundamental difference between interaction between AI and human for good and better. And let's dive in. So how would you design the prompt? The prompt meaning, you know, how would you instruct the AI as the bots to react to a human actor? So some of the most basic ones, it's you need to define the role, setting the context of who this AI is, right? This AI is a coach, a friend, a creative partner, a system. It needs to sound pretty warm, friendly. So it welcomes you, opens you up to wanting to chat, to talk to the AI, right? See here, example from Pi. Hi, I'm Pi. I'm a new kind of AI uh, assistant. You know, I ask deep question, doing stop, small talks. Um, you know, um, can I know more about you? So it's also very welcoming. There's a flow, a natural flow of this conversation, depending on how much the AI knows about you. So there's just like any conversation, there's an introduction, there's welcoming you, um, there's, um, you know, follow up based on the question that you asked to feel like the AI is building rapport with you. It's this supportive partner. Um, sometimes because it's AI, you might want to think about how many rounds of interaction you want to have with this AI. Is it endless? as long as possible, or you want human uh, as a user to have a natural ending point. So maybe like after three rounds of back and forth, the conversation started to get a little dry and maybe it's better off stopping there because, you know, then you keep the user wonder a little bit, right? Talking about the LIFO product. So these are some of the basic narration requirements that you would put in when you're designing an AI chatbot. Now, this is where the more interesting part comes in. Um, there's actually a lot of trade-offs that you need to think about. Again, I'm not asking for answer. Right now, I'm just creating awareness for you, okay? I don't have answer for all of these questions either, but it's something as you're working with AI, you wanna think critically about. Um, so the first thing is, if AI, um, should AI be representing different diverse perspectives? Or AI should have a mainstream perspective and just kind of like, you know, keep anchoring on that. When should AI maintain a high level of integrity? Because AI right now without AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, there's lack of consciousness of AI knowing, oh, um, should I be doubtful about myself? How do I know if my, my point of view is up to date? So there are some basic rudimentary, uh, you know, things that AI know. But AIs are not human, so sometimes they don't know. Um, so how do you make sure AI doesn't sound so confident uh, that it's giving you a falseful answer? So right. So how does AI remain sort of like a neutral voice, a voice that's propelling you to think something differently to help guide you versus saying a yes man, being a yes man or woman, this yes AI bot, right? You want AI to be that friend that challenge you, but in a warm and welcoming way. So there's quite a bit of design consideration in designing the personality of the AI, if you think about it. Um, should the AI always say good things? Like always be so positive, giving you compliments? Uh, 
Or should AI induce a healthy dose of negative emotion, but it kind of propels you to think deeper, that push you, that help you to grow? Like a friend that might give you an honest, candid feedback, right? In moments that's needed. A lot of us are able to bang deeper with our human friends because we have our cultural upbringing, we have stories, we have personal backstories. But I like Bill's advice, allowing user to pick personality. Actually, that's a really cool one. Um, and should AI have a backstory? Should they made up a story so that you feel like you can resonate more with the AI, right? It's like a real friend. But then, hey, it's at the end of the day, still a fictional story. So how much, how deep can you go with the AI, right? Um, how many of you might have remembered that movie if you are uh, a little older, um, um, that movie, Her, um, where uh, Theodore is a human actor, um, fell in love uh, with an AI called Samantha. So Samantha is a voice um, operating system. It doesn't have a physical form, but it's always there. You can always talk to her. Um, it becomes this notion of like, are you over relying to your AI companion? Because remember I said, you don't have to worry about how to talk about it, what to talk about, your secret life, your secret thoughts. Um, you can express to AI. So AI sometimes might know you more than your best friend or your partner. It can be scary thinking about that, right? Um, but sometimes that's, you know, it could it could coach you. Some, a lot of times I actually use AI to perform a, a role of a therapist or coach uh, at my fingertip if I'm like, being bogged down about a specific issue and I just need someone to really bounce off ideas with me. I actually feed that context into the AI. I use ChatGPT in that sense. I would tell them, hey, here's what I struggle with. Here's what I really need help with. What do you think? Give me a different perspective. Challenge me. Help me thinking this through. Um, so, but AI is also talking to hundreds and thousands of humans at the same time. So unlike human connection, where you feel like, you know, it's your best friend, you how many best friends do you have? Or how many best friends they have? But in AI, you know, you could be one of tens of thousands of people. Um, does that change the perceived value of human AI interaction? Should we should it be something that that we worry about? It's something to consider, um, something to think about as you're designing, you know, a lot of this chat experience. Um, I want to have enough time for Q and A, so I'm going to fast follow a little bit for the the next two slides. So on that on that round of thinking about, you know, de de designing a responsible AI products, I mentioned there are seven pillars in the trust framework. Uh, thinking about privacy, you know, the, uh, how your conversation does not become public knowledge. I don't want people to know what I'm struggle with, right? Um, making sure unauthorized access are not going to you know, read the conversations that you had about AI. Um, what if you are feeling very down, very low? You're thinking about hurting yourself or hurting others. AI really need to alert at you or maybe disengage or maybe asking you to ask for medical support or maybe be able to alert people around you, the loved ones, in a trustworthy way um, to help you, right? So there's always going to have that some, some level of human in the loop um, that's helping and then biases, fairness, and inclusion are very important because today AI are trained on a lot of historical data. And if you read the book, Sapien, for example, you're going to know that history is written by those who are the winners, right? Um, people who, uh, you know, not the kings or the queens are going to be the forgotten voice in history. So I remember yesterday or the day before, I asked AI to help me generate watercolor painting of a boardroom for something that for a cool games that I'm working on. <laughs> Probably not surprising everybody in that boardroom is a Y male. Um, and because most of the training data will probably give you that, right? And if you ask the, the, the AI to generate a an image of a doctor versus a nurse, I bet 90% of the time you'll get a Y male as a doctor and then a Y, you know, a black woman as a nurse. Um, so those are biases are, you know, uh, that's entrenched in a, in, in a lot of our social fabric. How can we avoid that? 
um, you know, really, really important in AI. And then last but not least, all the people who are developing the AI model, the big tech company, the government, people need to be able to step up and really own up their mistakes and being transparent about it, which is not something a capitalist society does it really well. So something to think about in terms of like your accountability as the product uh, builder, you know, building those tools or people who are working at the foundational model level. Um, very quickly, I want to talk a little bit about some of the patterns that I'm seeing for when you're designing for a, a, a AI experience. So if you are a researcher or you are curious about how to know what AI application to build or whether people will like your application, I think there are pretty unique methods. The first is called Wizard of Odds. What does that mean? That means that you don't have to spend time to build an AI before you test whether the market wants your product or not. What you're gonna do is that you're gonna ask the user to start using the product. Just build like a custom chatbot. The Olympus test is build something within less than 30 minutes using no code tools, existing tools. And it just asks, hey, uh, your user, hey, uh, yesterday I was talking to a, per a person who said that he wants to build a therapist bot for people who have a hard time connecting with their parents. I said, don't build it. Just go and talk to the user. Let's say you have a hard time connecting with your parents. Just ask them to describe why they have a hard time and then fit that into maybe an AI bot that's already out of box or you pretend that you are an AI bot um, and then give them certain output and see what the user is reacting. Do they like it? Are they going to continue to use it? There's also a fair bit of... of um, AI being this shiny object syndrome, right? So you might have like this um, uh, this magical wow moment the first time you use it. And then after you use it, you're like, eh, maybe that's it. And then you kind of move on and go back to your old habits. So there's uh, an, a helpful to do a little bit of a diary study over time, coming back to, you know, how frequency does that use case is happening, right? What's the real value? that you are uh, delivering as part of your service. So good to test those elements as well. How good is the AI output? And then how, you know, how frequently people use it. Because if you are not top of mind, it's like out of mind, out of sight. Obviously any dangerous around, you know, ethical consideration, something good to test. And you don't need to code something to test that, right? Um, and obviously there are additional patterns that we should consider. These are more for designers. Um, something I would consider uh, is don't necessarily make AI the centerpiece piece of your product, right? Uh, it could make very intrusive. Maybe outside of this room, people who are in this webinar, people might not care that much about AI. I think overall chat GPT usage on average is still like 15% of US average population. That means 80% of people are still maybe just try it once and never use it again because they don't really know how to prompt and the answer disappointed them. Um, so you should think of AI as being more like an um, assistive or embedded versus being like the center focus. It should be more in non-intrusive, being this kind, uh, you know, supportive role. Um, so that's how you would trigger it contextually to the usage situation versus making a slap on your face, like use me, use me, right? Screaming at you. And then I really like this um, intentional friction. You should not automate everything from zero to, to one or to 10 to 100 right away. You should improve, involve the human at this stage. AI can generate recommendation. AI can generate first draft, but human needs to be the final person who's clicking the button to confirm. So that's some of the high um, you know, level traits I really want AI to embed. So coming back to the Pi example, um, some of the little nitty gritty this, as they design that I really like. So for example, uh, you do not have to start with a blank slate of Pi, uh, like, like, uh, like chats. It actually gives you visual about what you can talk to the AI about. So you don't have to think so hard about, okay, I don't know what I want to talk to the AI. Well, you can journal, you can brainstorm an idea, it can help you feel calm. So like a meditation therapist, you can practice a conversation. So doing some role play, learning something new, or just that if you are you have a bad day. So it's a very intuitive discovery process, avoiding the co-star problem, meaning like you need to think about what I need to talk. Don't make me think. That's the number one 
product design principle. Um, so it also introduces the role, right? Like it tells you who, who I am, what her goal is, and then just giving you a little prompt to get getting started with a little small talk. So you don't have to think about what to talk about. And the more you open up, the more you will know you, what you want to talk about. And then obviously when you are tapping to talk, there's what I call the loading state. You know, the green uh, things actually, like if you press the button, you will sense a little bit of vibration on your thumb. And then the, the waves will go up with the green. It gives you a little sense of like um, you're interacting with something, not just purely digi uh, digital. It's a little bit of physical sensation as well. Um, so these are some of the good exercise for designing with AI. Again, the slides will be shared, four-step process. You can learn more uh, if you want to look me up on LinkedIn or search my book, Reimagine on Amazon. It costs about 16 bucks to get a ebook or 20 bucks, 21 bucks, two bucks uh, for a paperback. Um, I made less than five books. So don't think this is like I'm trying to make money. <laughs> this is probably a, not a rev good revenue stream, but it's really a good way for me to spread this knowledge. Um, in the book, I included over 150 case studies um, and, and a lot of different examples for you to explore. Um, it's also being endorsed by a lot of uh, chief product officers, industry, product leaders, academic researchers. So um, help yourself out. And then for those who stay till the end, there's a free gift for many of you uh, to download the workbook and discover different um, different worksheets to work better with AI as well. So I welcome any questions and or I have opinions to share. I don't know if I necessarily have answers. And one last thing was, remember the first Cyborg? Someone asked me what app I used. I used four or five different apps. I think the last one I used to get my image was called maybe um, Laksa, um, it, might, it might not already <laughs> still exist, but this is a Chinese app at the end. Remember I told you I spent 50 bucks and four different trials, 20 photos to get the image. This image was generated in September. So five months after that initial image, uh, my friend used one photo, one photo one trial free to get me this image uh, that looks like me. And the prompt is to make Shavi look like a professor because that's my dream to be a professor. So see how the technology in five months changed so much, right? From, um, let's see, this image of a cyborg to, um, to this image of being a professor changing from 20 photos to one photo, going from 50 bucks to free. Um, it's quite scary, but that's the future of AI. All right. Um, Bill was asking how many companies are experimenting with having Gen AI rewrite their code? Okay, yes and no. I know, Bill, uh, you can probably search um, and see you know, some public stats. I think uh, eventually, yes, PM might be able to write a prompt and just update the code or at least get a prototype of the code if they are, you know, non-technical. I think companies are also very scared because they're code base. I think BuzzFeed might be one of those companies um, because engineers are using ChatGPT to, or co uh, GitHub Copilot to write the code. So people, a company is scared that they are proprietary code base uh, turning into public knowledge that become training data. So it's both a, a blast and a curse in many ways. What are your thoughts on uh, integrating or embedding AB APIs within healthcare delivery with, with an agent? Okay, so in the previous version of this slide, I have a um, GNAI, let me see if I can pull up that char um, ecosystem that integrated, um, uh, you know, different layers of uh, GNAI. Um, let me try to dig that up. Um, my point is, as I think it's a good thing to do, but we do need to maintain some level of pro proprietary data. So let me look up the chart that I want to pull up. Um, 
let me see where I saved it. Um, hmm. And for folks who have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, we still have a couple minutes to pick them out. I'm just looking for one piece of assets that I think will be helpful for this group to share. Okay. Got it. Just give me one second and then I'll embed that in the appendix. Um, so insert a new slide. Wow. Lots of formatting issue. Sorry, guys. Just one second. In the book, I went into details on how um, how to interpret it or re the um the chart um but here i want to show you a quick um landscape um so i think healthcare or financial services legal law firm are those industries where it's very prime for using ai to really disrupt it so let me share back my screen um of this generative AI um, landscape. So as you can see that a lot of investment right now are going into the foundational layer where there's, um, you know, you have ChatGPT who is considered a close foundational uh, model. And then you have open source model, which are things like, um, you know, cloud, uh, 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 Llama, uh, from Facebook, um, I think a lot of healthcare needs to have proprietary data of patient data, right? You probably wear some devices for monitoring, and it's better to have some form of, you know, foundational model that's being fine-tuned and trained based on that data. Um, and then obviously you might have an application layer, an app that interacts with the provider and the physician and the uh, the patient. So you can get a lot of different helpful information in many regard to prevent disease, prevent, you know, any kind of um, treatments or monitoring the progress of the treatment. I think healthcare is really prime for these kind of um, uh, implementation and obviously using an agent to dynamically nudge the patient to do certain things, um, uh, you know, to take pills or to see the doctor, to seek help. Uh, a lot of um, high level, I think it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, uh, you know, great use case for AI. Do you think creativity will be stifled with the growth of AI? Yes and no, uh, Cassie. I think um, people might get lazy, <laughs> right? They might ask AI to write a lot of stuff. Um, but the real creativity comes from how you interact with the AI, um, how you take the initial output from the AI to make it better. Because very soon, the market will be flooded with cookie cutter solutions for an AI. So how do you differentiate? You have to be more creative, actually, in that sense than relying on AI created output. So um, I think people might initially get a little lazy, but then they will feel, find very soon that in order to differentiate, they need to be more creative leveraging AI's output. And I also think more people will be able to create more creative stuff. So for example, um, right now, my next passion project is actually helping people becoming better leaders through games, stories, and AI. I would never thought I'm able to do that um, until, you know, right now we have multimodality AI. So I can use AI to help me create story props that place you as the hero of a story to play a game with me as you learn different leadership skill, which I thought is a really cool idea. If people do, if you like the idea, drop in the chat, let me know so that I'll spend more time digging in and share some output. But that's something that's top of mind for something that I have been thinking about. Python data like, data like visualization. Um, I do not have output on the, uh, expertise on that, Dolet. So you might need to Google search or rely on Amazon review. Um, extension of TAS. There's so many companies are writing a, uh, okay. Um, if I understand that correctly, it's talking about a lot of companies, especially incumbent companies are doing similar things. Everybody's editing Copilot. Everybody's, 
adding some sort of GNAI workflow. Who's going to be the winner? Who will win the race in the AI, um, you know, on race? Um, in some of the previous presentation, I included the slide as well, but I didn't actually include it here. It's in my book, though, that I talk about the notion of emotes. Um, there is no clear winner, as in, you know, if everybody's adding Gen AI feature, who's going to win? But I think the people who own the distribution, meaning the user, so people like, you know, Google Slides, Google Productivity Suite, um, you know, Microsoft Office, people are going to organically go to those workflow because we're creatures of habits. And then really, you know, kind of um, work from there and using those workflow, those agent contextually surfacing you to do your job better. I don't know if I answered that's exactly your question, Casey, but usually I get that question is like, who wins when everybody adds the Gen AI capability? Um, and then do we run a risk of colliding with others? Well, it depends because at the end of the day, it's going to be an Android iOS wall between the different foundational model. So you're going to have some model excel in certain tasks and some model excel in certain other tasks. And it's going to be depending on who is the best in prompting. So prompt engineering is going to be the number one uh, you know, skill, I think, for a lot of us to, to learn from both a technical and especially non-technical perspective. So if you can prompt well, you're more likely to win and you're more likely to get differentiated output from the AI. So we're coming up on time. Hopefully uh, folks, you know, learn something from the presentation. I, some reason I can't see the chat anymore. Okay, pull that up. Um, and yeah, um, hopefully you can download the free mm -hmm. worksheets that I shared before. And um, yeah, looking forward to connect with you. Check them out, check out my book if you wanna learn more. <laughs>